Hi, everybody. This is Single Air Female. I'm your host, Lead Saeed. Single Air Female is a celebration of the incredible women of the Middle East. And it's also an opportunity to chat about the topics that we find a little bit taboo in our culture and community. So I'm sitting here with the awesome and incredible Najwa Zebian, writer, author, poet, activist. I don't know what else you can't do, um, mm-hmm. but I'm very, very lucky to have you join me here on this call all the way from Canada. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for being here. I want to jump right in and talk about what's happening in the world currently. There's a lot happening right now. Obviously, we're all in lockdown and we're video conferencing. Um, I'm doing it from California and you're doing it from Canada. I think it's, it's the perfect time to pick up your books. Mind Platter, Nectar of Pain, Sparks of Phoenix. I think what I love most about your writing and your words is its ability to transcend um, culture, um, border, religion. Um, there's nothing, um, there's no visual attached to it. Um, it's, it's available to anyone that is feeling those words and is feeling the need to kind of pick up your books. Um, I, I want to know from your perspective, uh, your words touching so many different people um, from all walks of life, what does that really say about the human experience as a whole? Well, I think what it really says is that we all are the same underneath. We all go through the same struggles. We all experience the same pains. But, you know, some people stick to certain labels that they refuse to break or they refuse to step over and they start all of a sudden not seeing other humans as humans. They see them more as that label that I want to label you with. Um, But yeah, the fact that, I mean, my writings have nothing to do with religion or culture, um, but the fact that anyone at any age from anywhere, any gender, any, anything can relate to them tells you that we are all the same underneath it all. You know, when it comes to, if you were to let go of all the things you were taught that you were, or all of the things that you were taught about life you are the same as everyone else around you. You know, you feel the same way. You experience the same kinds of emotions. And that's beautiful. And that's what we need to focus on. That's what that tells me. Absolutely. I think we could all use a little bit of that right about now. (laughs) I agree. I agree. Sometimes we tend to focus on the things that make us different. We don't realize that there's more that makes us the same. Yeah. So, as I said, it that stems from what society teaches us from a very young age, depending on where we live. It's not just uh, communities that are heavily um, culturally ruled or religiously ruled. I feel like it, it's the same everywhere, but it's in a different form. It takes a different cover. Sometimes it's religion, sometimes it's culture, sometimes it's tradition, sometimes it's race sometimes it's you know what i mean you you are taught certain things from a young age about others and about yourself and about the world and how you make sense of it regardless of where you're from right it happens everywhere absolutely yeah. i think one of the purposes of just to pivot slightly one of the purposes of single air female is to make sense of growing up arab in america and the identity crisis that i think a great deal of immigrant women experience there's sort of bound to be an Arab woman or a girl struggling with her identity. I know I still do, and I turned 27 this year. I think what advice would you give that girl or woman? And what advice would you have given yourself when you made the move to Canada at 16? You know, I always say, ask yourself, what do you want? Ask yourself, who am I? Instead of just following the rules, be curious ask questions, say when there's something that you don't like, or you don't agree with, express yourself and don't be, I feel like so many girls and women in our culture specifically are so ashamed of being a woman or being a girl. There's so much shame with that. There's so much that you have to hide. It's like, you can't really talk about your wants and your needs without feeling like that's a shameful thing, you know? Yeah. Um, Remember when I first started writing poetry, 
you know, I was single at the time, I'm single now, but I was younger and now I'm 30, but I started writing when I was 23. Um, and I remember some of the commentary that I would get, like, how could you be writing about love? You're single, like you're not married. It's inappropriate for you to be talking about things like this. Like, does this mean that you are in a relationship with someone without being married to them or without it being publicized that you're engaged or that whatever? And so it's like people weren't even focusing on the writing itself and the beauty of it. They were more focused on how could you? Like, this must mean something bad about you, you know? Um, so it took quite a bit of time for me to say, you know what? This is my art. This is how I feel. And this is probably one of the only outlets that I have to express my heart, to express my soul, to express my thoughts. And the fact that shame was always there to bring me down or to stop me from doing that just intensified it even more. You know, when, when you're taught that something is forbidden, like relationships, for example, you start to want that more. When you're taught that feeling is forbidden, you start feeling more intensely. When you're taught that questioning life and love and religion and culture is forbidden, you start questioning even more intensely, but instead of expressing it outward, out, outwardly, you start expressing it internally and inwardly. And in a way, you start feeling so isolated because expressing yourself somehow puts you in a spot to be even more ashamed and to be even more judged. So for any woman or girl who is of an Arab background living here, whether they've moved here recently or they've been here for a while, I would say at the end of the day, this is your life. This is, you are living this life. And if you are faithful or if you are religious, then you believe that your relationship with God is between you and God. It's not between you and people. And so as long as you have, you stick to whatever values you have, whether they are God based or not, this is your life. Like at the, at the very back of mind platter, I actually, I wrote this for a reason. So this was part of the writings, but mm -hmm. this book has been through hell. Um, I wrote at the end of the day, no one will walk your journey for you. You have to do that at the end of the day. No one will dream for you. You have to do that because I've met so many women from our communities who say things to me like in private they take me aside and say I'm so proud of you and it's like they can't even say it publicly because they're going to be judged for I'm so proud of you do you like live your life as you want to live it I wish that I lived my life the way that you're living it I've, I have so many women tell me that and it comes from a place of it's like they feel that they've accepted this way of living for so long that they have no more power anymore to change it. And so they have hope for the younger generations to do that. So I say, don't become that woman. Don't become that woman that at the end of your life, you're looking back saying, I wish I did this, or I wish I lived my life a certain way. I wish I said no, or I wish I didn't live by that rule. I wish I didn't feel like I needed to get married by a certain age. I wish I didn't feel like I had to have this many children by this age. I wish I, I wish I followed that dream that I had. Don't be that woman. Be the woman that says, now I want to go after this. Now I want to say no. Now I want to say, you know, I don't want to get married right now. Like I want to focus on myself, you know? Just ask yourself, what do you really want? and go for it. And it's going to be hard. I've made many decisions that put me in a position, you know, to be um, judged, not just by society, but even, even family, you know, not judged, but just, where did that come from? Like, what, why are you thinking this way? Like, why have you changed your mind? Why are you changing this way? Why do you you know, when I took my hijab off, for example, that was a shock to everybody. And um, like my parents, for example, I remember when I wore it when I was young, I was 13 and I was 12 or 13. I was in grade seven. Um, 
I was attending an Islamic school in Lebanon. And that night, my dad took me aside and he said, did someone tell you you have to wear it? Because I don't care if you do, but I want to make sure that no one forced you to. And I said, no, I want to wear it. And the reason I wanted to wear it was that at that school, I was taught that to be a good girl, you had to wear it to be closer to God. And um, so then when I moved here at fully at 16, um, my dad took me aside again. He said, look, I know you're sensitive. You're living in a new country now. Because before I would visit family in Canada, but never lived here for a long time. Mm -hmm. Whereas the rest of my family did, like all of my siblings were born and raised here. I was the only one born in Lebanon. And so when I finally came here to join all of them, um, now it was like, okay, now you're going to be here. Now you're going to go to school here. So my dad said, um, you know, I know you're sensitive. People here are different. Like back home, it was a normal thing for you to be covered, but here it might not be. So I just want you to know that if you want to take it off, that's okay with me. And I said, why would I take it off? Like it was part of my identity at that point. You know, it becomes like a safety blanket. Like that's it. I'm, and I didn't, realized that I, the society looked at me differently as a result of it until one time I was on the bus to university and this older man kept staring at me. And then, you know, as soon as he, got, like he was about to step off the bus, he didn't even give me a chance to, to talk to him. He just said, you know, you're in Canada, you don't have to dress like that. And he just left. And so that's when I, that's when it hit me yes, people look at me differently. And that's when I started thinking like, why am I wearing it? And what's the purpose and whatever. And to me, taking it off at the time would have been weakness. Whereas, um, you know, to society, it would have been courage to take it off. But for me, it was like, I'm not going to change the way I look so that people can respect me. They should respect me. However, I dress over the, for the longest time. I stuck to that. Me wearing it was courageous and then, um, and this would have been two or three years ago when I decided to, to share a story of sexual harassment with a, an older member of the Muslim community here. And, you know, to see the response that I got from especially the, the leadership or those who had some kind of a say in the community, where it was like... A, Overnight, I went from being this angel to being the devil and to being like, it was my fault all of a sudden. And I just didn't feel like people stood up for me. I mean, some did, but most didn't. And I was looked at as like, they just wanted to hide it. You know, I was looked at as you're making us look bad. Yeah. And I was like, what is the purpose of being part of this community? Yeah. If, can't, if you are telling me that I wear this on my head for protection, where's the protection? Why aren't you fighting for me? Why aren't you protecting me? Whatever that means. Not that I was waiting for someone to protect me, but the, the intensity of that response that's like something is wrong with you for having experienced that. And please be quiet because we don't want the, we already have eyes on us as we are bad people. Don't make us look even worse. I, that's when I started, I started questioning everything. I started questioning, what do I stand for? And who am I? Like, I didn't really know who I was until, you know, like I said, overnight, I went from being someone who no one had an issue with to someone who so many people had an issue with and it's mm -hmm. like if i am going to allow the way that the world sees me to dictate how i am then i am not anyone i am just a somebody who is uh, like i i'm i'm a loose leaf in the wind and i don't know where my roots are i don't know who i am so that's when i started asking myself what do i stand for and does my image represent what i stand for because I personally never believed that hijab was um, an obligation. I thought it was a choice. A woman could choose it. And I still believe that. But then I thought for the longest time I wore it as a sign of courage and I wore it to show the world and to show as a teacher amongst all the others that, you know, Islam is good. You know, I wanted to be in a way 
showing people that it's good. And then I was like, why am I carrying this responsibility? Why do I have to be the one who on top of everyone in the community putting me down because I came forward and shared my story? Why do I have to be the one who's making you look good? You know, go make yourself look good through your actions. And I personally, when I picture myself in my mind, I don't see myself wearing the hijab. I see myself like this. I see myself as I am every single day. And so as soon as I realized that, I knew that I just had to make that transition. And it's like, it was like ripping a bandaid off. I just had to do it at some point. And I did. And um, on top of all the, the, the negativity that I was receiving now, I was receiving more like, yeah, we told you something was wrong with her. Like, look at her now. She's, she also took her hijab off she moved out she's living on her own now she wants to live like everybody else and it's just like why is it any of your business how i want to live like and so in a way all of that judgment and i'm saying this for any girl or woman who's listening to this to recognize that there will always be an opinion a pre-made judgment about any decision you make if you move out, it must mean that you want to do things that are um, sinful or, um, you know, you want to be, you want to go out with guys and hide it. And you don't like, that's the kind of, those were the kinds of comments I was getting like, oh, she must be dating different people. And mm -hmm. she doesn't know. And she must be like, why do you need your own place? Why? What are you trying to hide? And it's just like, I literally want a place to be able to write on my own. I was 27 at the time, 27 years old and moving out apparently was like, what if I moved out because I got married? Like, why, why is the first place I need to move out into? Why does it have to be my husband's home? And if I didn't get married, does that mean that I stay at my parents' house forever? Mm -hmm. Like, why can't I, why at 21 or 22 or sometimes even 18 or 17, why would I be able to make the decision to get married and start having children, but I'm not able to make the decision of moving out or I'm not able to make the decision of, I don't want to wear the hijab or I want to wear the hijab. You know what I mean? Yeah. So to any woman or girl listening, I would say there's always going to be that pre-made judgment. There is a list of things waiting to be told to you based on the decision that you make. And if you are living your life for people, you will follow those lists and you will continue to live in shame and in fear because you are building your identity based on what others are telling you your identity is instead of what you believe your identity is. If you believe that hijab is part of your identity, I support you 100%. But do you believe that? It's not about those around you believing that. Do you believe that? If you believe that, you know, you should stay living at your parents' home until you get married, if that's the first, the first experience that you have outside of your parents' home is with a man that you get married to, if you fully believe that, go for it. But don't just do it not wanting to do it, but fearing not doing it so that you don't, um, so that you don't upset those around you. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. I get really passionate about things like this. In I case can you hear that. I can hear that in your tone and I do too. And for me, it comes out in different ways. And you were talking a little bit how there's pre-made judgments. I think growing up, um, anytime I wanted to do something remotely American, it was like I was upsetting my entire family and my entire community. And like you were saying, it's this pre-made judgment. It's like, oh, can I, can I do this? And then it's like, oh, you want to be American now? Like you don't yeah. care about your culture and you don't care about where you come from. And it's become this almost fine balance growing up and and trying to trying to melt the two, trying to marry two very opposite, very different cultures, trying to make both happy, which is a lot of pressure on one person. Absolutely. And we especially put it on our girls to have to deal with that, to have to um, 
figure out a way to find this this middle path, figure out a way to to marry two cultures that are so strikingly different. Growing up, anytime I did something bad, I was quite rebellious growing up. I I yeah. pushed every boundary and every envelope and um I I was the first of three girls or the oldest of three girls and I didn't have anybody to look up to. No one kind of built that path for me. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, media representations didn't really speak my story. And so I kind of had to figure it all out on my own. And there are now starting to become these resources for women like me, when women like us, but there still is a lack of resources for our parents who are making a really big adjustment and who are sacrificing a great deal to be here, but not understanding what that looks like for their children um, and what kind of pressure that looks like for them. So I, I get really excited when I hear stories like yours because it mimics so much of my own experience. And it's really exciting because there's a girl in Ohio right now who's growing up in white suburbia and not having someone to look up to um, who's had that same experience, who's walking that same line and path. And um, I think it's so important to have this type of representation 